Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Simmerman. I'm an endodontist. I practice in uh, Stony Brook, New York. I'm also the former uh, head of the endodontic department at the Stony Brook School of Dental Medicine. And today I'm going to talk about a very important topic in endodontics. That's endodontic testing and diagnosis. What are some of the examination procedures in diagnosis? It's important to ask the patient their chief complaint. They'll tell you why they're in your office and get a history of their complaint. Are they sensitive to hot or cold or chewing? Are they having trouble eating? Has there been any recent dental work or trauma they've experienced? And this will help you with your diagnosis. Then it's important to do endodontic testing and thorough radiographic exam. Let's start with endodontic testing. We do thermal testing, percussion testing, palpation testing, electric pulp testing, and we use the tooth sleuth, and I'll explain each of these. Okay. For thermal testing, uh, I like to use a product called Endoice. It's a refrigerant spray. It's the same temperature as dry ice. There are different brand names of this product as well, and what you do is you spray a cotton pellet uh, until it's frosty, and then you place it on the tooth uh, for a couple of seconds. If you get no response, it means the tooth is non-vital. If uh, you get a response just for a couple of seconds after you remove the pellet, that's a normal response. And then if the pain lingers on for more than 30 seconds, that's an abnormal response. And that would mean that the tooth has an irreversible pulpitis and requires endodontic therapy. If you don't have the endo ice, you can also use a thin sliver of an ice cube as well. It works as well. The endo ice is a little bit colder, so it's more effective when you're testing crowns. Sometimes a patient will complain of heat sensitivity. They'll come in and say, oh, it hurts when I eat hot food or drink coffee or tea. Uh, and this is very hard to localize. Uh, one way of doing it is to put uh, liquid that's coffee temperature into a syringe and put a couple of drops on each tooth with a small suction nearby, being careful not to get any on the gingival tissue, which can get burned by the hot water. And then you see what kind of response they have. And you might be able to localize the tooth that's causing the problem. Another thing we do is we use the electric pulp tester. I like the analytic technology pulp tester. Uh, this area here, there's a readout from zero to 80. If the readout gets up to 80 and you get no response, that's a negative electric pulp test. And then there's a rate control in the dial on the side. You see it's set on one. Uh, I like the current to go up very slowly so the patient doesn't get a jolt. And the way this works is you take the probe, you put a little toothpaste on the tip of the probe, you dry off the tooth, you put this in the middle third of the tooth, and you can have the patient hold the metal part of the probe with their two fingers, and that completes the circuit, and then it'll go up from zero to 80. The number is not that significant. What is significant is whether you get a response or not by the time you get to 80. So if you get a response and then the tooth is also normal to cold, that means it's vital. If you don't get a response, there's a 90% chance that it's not vital. Okay. Uh, you could test the teeth to percussion. It'll help you localize which tooth is causing the pain. If there's inflammation at the apex, the patient will have pain. And also you can palpate the soft tissue on the buckle of the tooth. You run your finger along the root. When you get to the apex, sometimes you can feel a little bump or swelling there, or the patient will be sensitive and you can localize the pain that way. Uh, check the mobility of the tooth and always periprobe perio probe every tooth that you're going to treat. What commonly happens is if the tooth is cracked and you go around the tooth and you probe it and you get two and three millimeter probing depths and then in one spot it drops in six, there's a good chance there's a fracture in the tooth. And here's an example of that where this tooth had two to three millimeter probing, but on the straight buckle there was a five millimeter probing and that was in, re in response to a fracture. The tooth sleuth is very useful as well. If you look here, there's a flat part. There's also a pointy part. The pointy part can go in the fossa of posterior tooth, teeth, and the flat part can go on each cusp tip. And you have the patient bite and open on the tooth sleuth, and you might be able to localize which tooth is sensitive to chewing with the tooth sleuth. If the pain is greater when the patient releases, that might indicate that the tooth is cracked. So this is another useful device. And here you see a case where uh, we found that it was sensitive on the bicuspid, and you can see a fracture here. This was stained with methylene blue. And if you have a fracture that goes all the way across the tooth and into the pulp chamber, that tooth has a hopeless prognosis and needs to be extracted. What if you have a sinus tract? A sinus tract is a pathway that the infection takes from the apex of a tooth out to the soft tissue. It could be extraoral or intraoral. If you have a sinus tract, it's a good idea to trace it to see where the infection is coming from. 
Uh, in this particular case, the patient had tooth number five extracted. And the way I like to do this is I take the gutta percha, I'll soak it in bleach and adapt and dish for two minutes. Then I'll clean the bleach off with alcohol and then I'll feed it into the sinus tract gently. It'll follow the path uh, of where the infection is coming from. And in this particular case, they had tooth extracted, but you can see it was traced to the apex of number three. And if you look closely at three, you might be able to make out a periapical radiolucency. Then you pulp test it, you get a non-vital response. But you know, when you see the sinus tract in the anterior region, you may not be looking at the molar in the back. So if you have a sinus tract trace, uh, X-rays are very important in your diagnosis. It's good to use paralleling devices to take accurate radiographs. This is a RIN device with an X-ray sensor. You can cover the sensor with plastic. It's good to take a, an X-ray that's perpendicular to the tooth and also to take one from the mesial, and this way you can see multiple roots and get more information. It's also very important to take a bite wing to check the margins of the restorations to see if there's any caries. And now we have access to 3D imaging with CBCT, which can give us a lot of information as well. So what are the limitations of 2D radiographs? This was a study done by uh, Bender and Seltzer in the 60s. It was reprinted in 2003. And what they found was that extensive disease of bone may be present even when there's no evidence of it on the x-ray. They took a jaw and then they took an x-ray of the jaw. And here you see the mental foramen and you can make it out over here and the bone looks normal around the tooth. Then they drilled holes in the jaw and if you look down here, this is the mental foramen, and they drilled holes of differing depths. So the first hole they drilled did not perforate the cortical plate, and then they went deeper and deeper. By the third hole, they were through the buccal plate. By the last hole, they were through and through to the lingual plate. And if you look at the x-rays, as you go to the back, you see a more and more distinct periapical uh, circle. So if you could actually have a tooth that's non-vital and there could be a lesion in the marrow space of the bone that has not yet perforated the cortical plate and you will not see it on a normal uh, regular 2D radiograph. So now we're using CBCTs. This was a study done by Lowe and they showed that 34% of the lesions detected with cone beam tomography were missed with periapical rate x-rays and maxillary premolars and molars. So you're missing a third of the lesions with regular x-rays. And they found additional things like lesion expansion into the sinus, sinus membrane thickening, missed canals, presence of apical marginal defects. And these were more frequently seen on the cone beam than periapical radiographs. So the cone beam is a great tool in addition to periapical radiographs. Uh, people are concerned about the dosage of x-rays. The dosage of radiation that measures the amount of absorbed radiation is the microsievert. So just to compare certain things, um, if you take a full mouth series, it's about 90 microsieverts. If you fly from New York to Los Angeles at 30,000 feet, you're being exposed to 40 microsieverts. So that's, you know, that's what these pilots are exposed to all the time. A medical CT can measure over 3,000 microsieverts and a small field of view CBCT, which is what we use in our practice, care stream unit, or there's also a Merida unit that's similar to that, you're only going to be exposed to about 14 microsieverts, which isn't a lot. It's probably the equivalent of two or three periapical x-rays. So for the price of radiation of two or three radi uh, periapical radiographs, you're getting a 3D image of about three or four teeth, which is incredible. Uh, we actually did a study to, to reproduce this at Stony Brook. Uh, and we had these heads that we used that we placed x-ray sensors, and we did this in conjunction with Sloan Kettering, who measured the radiation doses for us. We exposed an adult female head, and what we found was the average dose of a tooth number six was 12.3, and tooth number 14 was 10.4 on an adult female, and that's about two x-rays for uh, a maxillary CBCT. And then we've been using CBCTs on pediatric patients in trauma cases. And, you know, we were concerned about using them on children, but even tooth number six was 17.8, which isn't a lot. It's probably like taking two or three x-rays. And in the past, what we would do if a trauma patient came in is we would take x-rays from different angles and probably exceed that dose that we're getting on the cone beam. And for number 14, it was less because there was no uh, uh, salivary glands in that area that, you know, we were being exposed or other tissue that's sensitive. Okay. So this is like a case that came into our office um, and it's tooth number 14. The tooth was sensitive to percussion and palpation. If you look at the x-ray, you can see 
uh, the sinus and the zygomatic arch is superimposed over the tooth. And uh, you can't really see that much. And you do the CBCT and you could see on, on the uh, sagittal view, which is the second image, uh, a large buccal radiolucency that encompasses the mesial buccal and distal buccal root. And on the palatal root, you can see that the root is filled slightly short and there's a lesion on the palatal root. And this is very useful because if we're retreating cases, we want to know which roots have failed and we probably only need to retreat the failing root. In this case, it's all three of them. Sometimes there's a large post in the palatal root. And let's say there's a lesion on the mesial buccal and there's no lesion on the palatal and there's a large post, then we don't have to take the post out and we can save the crown. Another case here, this patient was hit in the mouth uh, and uh, tooth number eight has swelling in the mucobuccal fold and we take our x-ray and you could see a large post in the tooth with gutta percha, but you don't really see anything periapically. And then we do our comb beam. And if you look here, you can see a fracture in the sagittal view. So this tooth had to be extracted. Okay. Another case here, this patient presented with a previous root canal. It was sensitive to percussion and palpation. There's a lesion on the 2D radiograph you can make out on the mesial buccal root. You really can't see much on the other roots and the sin you can't see much in the sinus. The patient also had a complaint of a severe sinus congestion. We take our comb beam. Now, if you look here, you can see this is the mesial buccal. There's a lesion here. It perforates the sinus, and there's a radio opacity or fluid in the sinus. It's completely full. If you look at the axial view, when we do analyze this in our office, we're looking for extra roots. So this is the distal buccal. The gut approach is centered. The palatal centered, but if you look at the mesial buckle, it's a little towards the buckle and the roots very wide. If you see something like this, there's usually another mesial buckle canal and it's usually located over here. And that could be the reason the case failed. So then we know when we retreat this case, it's important to look for a fourth canal. So the case was treated. This is the pre op CBCT with the area and the fluid in the sinus. And if you look at the post op CBCT, you can see I found the other canal. There's two mesial buccal canals. This is six months later. The lesion's almost completely healed. The floor of the sinus has reformed, and there's just a very thin thickening of the sinus membrane. So, and this patient's sinus problem disappeared. So that happens a lot where the patient might be seeing an ENT doctor for months, and they can't figure out what's going on, and it ends up that there's a tooth that's causing the problem. We treat the tooth, and the problem resolves. So it's important to know if the pain originates from a tooth as well. Uh, if you can't reproduce the patient's symptoms, you really shouldn't treat anything. You shouldn't guess. You might do the wrong tooth. Pain on chewing can be reproduced by using a tooth sleuth, and pain to cold or hot can be reproduced by applying heat or cold. There are other things that can cause oral pain as well. You have to be aware of possible TMJ problems. Sometimes that can cause pain to the upper posterior area. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia or viral infections, neurovascular problems like migraines or cluster headaches, uh, sinusitis, which we showed a case of, cardiac pain, uh, a patient can have angina and can have pain that radiates to their lower jaw and psychogenic pain as well. So uh, if you're not sure and you've narrowed it down, sometimes you can get the patient numb, apply local anesthetics. For example, Let's say there's two teeth that are in question that are sensitive, large restorations, you're not sure which one it is, and your best guess it's a lower molar. If you give a mandibular bock, the pain should go away. If it's an upper tooth that you're trying to uh, determine whether it's uh, a dental problem or not, and you're suspicious of uh, an upper molar, if you anesthetize the patient and they, you have all the signs of anesthesia, you can pulp test it to make sure it's numb, uh, and if it is uh, under local anesthesia and the patient's still having pain, there might be a non-odontogenic source of that pain. Sometimes what happens in our practice, uh, if the pain isn't localized and we do our testing and we can't figure out which tooth it is, uh, I'll have the patient come back in a couple of days. Especially if they're on pain medication, uh, there have been studies showing that if done ibuprofen, uh, it will reduce percussion pain by 25%, cold pain by 25%. And you might miss a diagnosis of symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, you know, because of the pain medication. And another issue is if the patient's been prescribed antibiotics a couple of days before to get to your office, 
uh, it might be masking the symptoms as well, especially if it's an infected or non-vital tooth. So you have to be careful of that. If you're not sure, don't treat the tooth, have them come back. And just to show an example of what can happen, uh, this was a patient that was referred to me for tooth number eight. Uh, we pulp tested the tooth. It was sensitive, normal to cold, and the electric pulp test responded. But there was swelling in the mucobuccal fold. It was kind of a hard swelling. The tooth was sensitive to percussion. Uh, the x-ray revealed a thickened PDL at the apex. We did a scan, and I'll show you a close-up of the sagittal view. And you can see on the palatal of this tooth, the PDL is thickened and there's no lamina dura. So you might think that the tooth is fractured. But with a swelling and positive pulp testings, the first thing you should do is biopsy that area. The patient was referred to an oral surgeon, and uh, the biopsy came back as an osteosarcoma. And this is very rare, but it can happen. And it happened in my practice. And I've had several cases like this where I didn't treat the teeth and it came back as, as some other sort of pathology that needed different treatment. So in conclusion, a thorough examination will lead you to an accurate diagnosis and then you'll perform the correct treatment. Thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful and I hope to see you again.